A while ago, I was really thinking about if I had to say what I base my life on, what would, what would it be when, when I come to think of God and his ways and my belief in him, what would be the things I would pick out that would give me certainty and shape for my life? I'm not thinking so much as reasons why the Bible is true. That's a fascinating subject and we often talk about it here. Whether we think of the wonder of fulfilled Bible prophecy, the fact that what God said he would do thousands of years ago, he has done. Or whether we consider the wonder of the way that the scripture is so intricately connected, written as it was by so many different writers over such a long period of time, and yet it has a consistent message. However we come to think of it, or perhaps some of the wonders that we find in the Bible, the, the hygiene laws, for example, that we find in the Old Testament books of Moses that were centuries, if not thousands of years ahead of modern science, those all give evidence that the Bible is God's word. But I'm taking that as read tonight. And I'm thinking then, well now, what is it then, if that is true? What is the basis then for my life? And, and whatever category you fall into, whether you believe the Bible or not, it's worth just considering how the reality of this might be in our own lives, if indeed these things are true, that at least we might examine the evidence, if nothing more. Now, these five facts, I'm going to suggest to you that they would apply at whatever period of history one lived demonstrably since New Testament times, and I'm going to argue before as well, and that they apply at all stages in the journey of faith, whether we're just at the beginning, beginning to learn about God, or whether we've been following in the way of the Lord Jesus for many years, or indeed at whatever stage of life we are, whether we're just getting going in life, or indeed whether we have been travelling on that road for many years. Th these five principles I'm going to suggest hold true in all of those cases. And they provide a basis for our lives. Well, let me explain what I mean then, these five. Here's the first. And each of these I start out with a summary statement, which we then look at some Bible passages to support. Here's the first one then. I have a loving Heavenly Father who created me, who understands my frailty, who cares for me and who hears my prayer. That's my belief. And I say it is a fact because the Bible talks of faith giving substance to what we cannot see. And if the Bible is true, then that which starts out as a belief can be as certain as we might think of as a fact. <coughs> If we believe that God has done certain things in the past, that he is actively involved in our world and in our lives, and if this book is his word, then these things are facts. That's the way I look at it, anyway. So what about this concept, then, of our <coughs> loving Heavenly Father? Let's think about some of the evidences in the Bible that would lead us to think of this and what the consequences might be. So God has created us. Thy hands have fashioned me. There's the reality of Bible teaching, which is that God is our creator. And that has certain implications. He who created all things created us. And the Bible presents him not just as one who created all things at the beginning, but one who is still involved and interested in his creation. Indeed, if we just go to Psalm 103, let's just, just turn there as we read together and see how he presents the implications of this for us. Right, Psalm 103. Let's just have a look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. This is the reality, the Bible says, of the great God who created us. This is what he is like. This is the wonder of his ways. You see how he describes us, one who created us, who is gracious and slow to anger. 
And the evidence is, as we read through the Bible, he has demonstrated how very long-suffering and patient he is. And that gives us encouragement. Not that we should presume upon that mercy. But God understands how it is for us. And if only we will take hold of his ways and seek his mercy, he is pleased to be the merciful to us. And he shows us the reason why. He says, well, verse 10, he's not dealt with us after that which we might deserve. But rather, verse 12, if we seek him in his ways, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, and in that wonderful way, separated us from that which might otherwise condemn us. This is the opportunity he's saying to us we have, and as we shall see through the work of the Lord Jesus, to take hold of that forgiveness. Now come now to verse 13. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. So here's the condition then. God is ready and willing to show mercy and grace to his creation. He understands how it is for us. Verse 13 said, verse 14 says, he knows our frame. He remembers we're dust. He created us. God is greater than us, as high as the heavens are above the earth. And yet that very gulf, that very distance, becomes the measure of his mercy towards us. And he understands our difficulty and our weakness. He remembers we are dust. So our common human experience is, the Bible says, and perhaps your experience confirms it like mine does, that we find it much easier to do the wrong thing than the right thing. The Bible says God knows that. And if we come to him in the right way, you notice what we read there in verse 13, to them that fear him. And he's not talking about somebody necessarily that, that is in total terror, but rather that reverential respect that we should have towards our creator who seeks his mercy. Well, then God will be merciful if we approach him on his terms. He invites us then in that next passage, to cast our care upon him because he cares for us. He's ready and willing to support us if only we put our trust in him. And when we go through the difficulties and the challenges of life, it's not that we're intended to go through it all on our own. But sometimes we don't have the answer to everything, do we? He's calling on us to trust in him, rather. And he hears our cry. For we read there in the psalm, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Those people who are seeking him and his ways and his mercies, he listens, he hears, the, actually the creator will hear what we say to him if we approach him in the right way <coughs> that he might help. So here's the thing, the God who created all things is still interested in his creation, in us, if we approach him. He cares for us, if we come to him seeking his mercy and his forgiveness, and the consequences for our lives then. I recognise every day as a blessing from God. On waking, I can thank my creator for giving me a new day and new opportunities to serve him. He understands my frame. He remembers that I am dust. I can plead for strength to bear the burdens of each day, trusting that he will provide for my needs according to his wisdom. You see, to believe that God exists is one thing. To acknowledge him as a creator who still exists is something else. But a God who is close at hand, who knows and who cares, who is actively interested in our lives, puts our lives in a different context. How would my life be if every moment of every day I could remember the reality of that fact? That when I hit the difficulties and the challenges of life, I am not on my own, but I can call on a creator, seek his mercy and his help, that I might walk before him.